Hello and welcome back to the Outside and Active podcast. My name's Dom and I'll be playing host to conversations tailored for those who love the outdoors. Thank you for joining me on this adventure where I speak to a whole host of interesting guests with inspiring stories. And for our next stop on this adventure, I'm joined by legendary British hurdler, Colin Jackson. Colin is a former British hurdler who is widely regarded as one of the greatest athletes in the history of track and field. Known for his incredible speed and agility, Jackson dominated the field of hurdling during his career. One of his most remarkable achievements was setting the world record for 110 meter hurdles back in 1993. He set a time of 12.91 seconds, a record which stood for just over a decade. After retiring in 2003, Colin continued to be involved in the world of sport through commentary, punditry, and motivational speaking. And in this episode of the Outside and Active podcast, we chat to Colin about the illustrious career that he enjoyed, as well as some of the charitable endeavors that he has taken on since his retirement. But just before we jump into it, a word from the two sponsors of this episode. Dry Rope is the original outdoor changing rope, designed to help you get outside and active, whatever the weather. A bit like having your own portable changing room, the oversized design of the Dry Rope Advance gives you plenty of space to get changed in and out of a wetsuit or sports kit, but is versatile enough to be worn as a coat or jacket. Made from 100% recycled fabric, the waterproof and windproof outer protects you from the elements, whilst it's super warm in the lining, helps you dry quickly after getting out of the water. What people really love about the Dry Robe Advance though is its versatility. It's perfect for a huge range of outdoor activities, including surfing, wild swimming, triathlon, paddle boarding, mountain biking, camping, and even just walking your dog in the torrential rain. To find out more, head to dryrobe.com. And secondly, Boost Bikes is a British conversion kit which transformed just about any standard bicycle into an e-bike for a fraction of the cost. The second system uses the same chip as Apple does for its air tags and regular software updates, keeping it operating at optimum efficiency. The Boost motor is mounted in a bike's rear wheel which provides increased stability and a smoother ride, while the battery is simply fitted in a cage, like a water bottle. The Boost system retails for £695 and you can track down your local buy shop to purchase it there by heading to boostbikes.uk or you can also order the product online and fit it yourself. And without further ado, let's head straight into this episode of the Outside and Active podcast with Colin Jackson. But we're good. We're here. We're at the National Running Show, Colin. <laughs> the camera <laughs> is recorded. Going. Yeah, everything's going. Yeah. No, thank you very much for joining. How are you doing? I am really well. I cannot complain whatsoever, we're, even though I want to, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a hall. Well, we've just come outside of the hall, but mm. we're in a hall, a, a load of runners, and you're mm. chatting to lots and lots of different people. What's it like to be surrounded by people that all have the same sort of interests? Do you know it's really fascinating when um, when you talk to runners in that sense because you. you kind of get re-engaged with the with, with the everyday runner is the word I want to use you yeah. know because it's very different to the professional runners you know and their stories are very different and and when you get engaged with the, the people who are your fan base as well yep. which is fantastic um and they tell you their stories they want to share what they do with you and, it, and it's just it is really just a, a genuine loving community it's a good one to be part of exactly couldn't put it better, better myself uh, asking you a question that I ask to everyone that comes onto the podcast, mm-hmm. and what do you love about being outside and active? What's not to love? I mean, that's the, the, the thing I always start with in that sense. I mean, we are designed not to be indoors and sitting around. We are designed as human beings to get out there and enjoy the, the real loveliness of, of the open wilderness. You know, and I see that from, from running, from walking. You know, I ski, I snowboard, I'm very active. I, I, I just recently, I know you're looking at me thinking, Colin, why don't you grow up? But I've just <laughs> literally started skateboarding. Never skateboarded Amazing. in my life. Just started skateboarding. Um, I can't claim to be a cyclist when I own an e-bike. But in <laughs> <laughs> the same breath, you know, just it's just being active and just being outside. I absolutely love it. You can't beat it. Because you, you've played sport from, from an early age. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the main sports, football, cricket, rugby. Yeah. Where did you then start to find athletics and how did you then realise that, oh, I'm actually quite good at this and (laughs) I might have to focus on this and and kind of drop the other ones? (laughs) I realised I was good at athletics the day I retired. (laughs) (laughs) Because I realised I wasn't good at anything else. So I realised I I must have been good at this this, this thing here called athletics. But, you know, know, I got into athletics. It was always quite uh, interesting, really. Because, like you say, I did all the other sports as well. Played at really decent levels. But um, I was... 
<laughs> say to youngsters, I go into athletics from being lazy, right? Now, hear me out when I say this. <laughs> yeah, right. Let me, let me <laughs> hear me out when I say this. So I was 15 and I had to make a decision um, whether I was going to play cricket or do uh, athletics. Now, how I made the decision was there was a race and a cricket match exactly the same day. And the cricket match was a three-hour drive away. The competition, the race competition, was a five minutes walk from the house. And of course, you know, I'm lazy. I am gonna take the I'm gonna take the, the athletics corner. around the corner. I wanted to get home to watch Grange Hill, fish, bash, bosh. I ran, did my business, came home, <laughs> never picked up a cricket bat again. And literally, and I'm not joking, that is how I made that really? decision. Yeah. It's like a sliding doors moment. Yeah, yeah. It's like gonna yeah, yeah. go with that one. And it's bizarre because if if the cricket match had been closer, I would have made the same, I would just play cricket. And athletics would have just gone by the wayside. Was it quite similar in terms of, because I enjoy my cricket. I know a lot of people, you know, maybe not, not like cricket as much, but love cricket. So two questions, what what were you batting, bowling? And then uh, and then was it quite a similar level? And then you just, again, what, decided to go down the path of athletics? My most probably, my cricket level was most probably better than yeah. my, my athletics level at that age. Because um, I, I was an all-rounder, so I used to open the bowling and I used to bat at number four. Oh, right, so okay. I was half decent. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fielding in the ring as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was half decent um, as a cricket player. And I played for the county, you know, uh, that by school boy county cricket. So I was, you know, pretty decent at it. And, you know, there's always that scene and they say, if you can see it, you can be it. And our family was from Jamaica in that sense. And I had lots of the, the, the West Indies team when they used to travel. I used to go to my grandparents' house. And so I used to see them a lot as well. So I used to think, well, that's what I want to be. I never saw sprinters or hurdlers firsthand coming to my grandparents' house that I was going to witness uh, running later on. So, you know, I was very much steering towards that yeah. cricket line. Yeah. And just Athletics laziness took over. Took over. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, that. That's the message. If, if just be lazy and, and it will be success. <laughs> yeah. If you told me I'd have to work this out, I'd have stayed with cricket. Trust me. <laughs> so that was around sort of 15-year-olds. 15, 15, yeah, so then four years later, considering there's that sliding doors mm. moment, you're winning medals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening in that four years? Is it, right, really intense? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really work on this. Um. Well, uh, no, not really. I think you just keep going you just develop yeah. you know and and actually at that stage i mean at 19 i won the world junior title in, in, in the highs and, but i actually went to those championships to do long jump hurdles and the four by one but i got injured uh, about two weeks before the championship so i had to stay out of the long jump yeah because it was too close to the, the beginning of the program the championship program then i um they pulled me out the relay team because i hadn't done any squad training uh, and then the only thing that was left was hurdles. So right at the back end of the championships, I tried my leg and it was okay in the heat and I pushed a little harder in the semi-final. And then I win the final, running second fastest time ever as a, as, as a junior. And um, yeah, that's just literally how I ended up doing, <laughs> doing hurdles and doing that way. So I never really, I never really specialised until after that championship because I still was yeah, dabbling with long jump as well as uh, as high hurdles at that time. And does it all go like a flash, like those those years when you're competing, you're training, and it's it's all quite intense? Does it go quite quickly, or are you, were you able to look? Are you able to look back now and go, oh, I could enjoy a lot of it? I didn't enjoy it at the time, <laughs> you know. And I mean, when, and, and it's odd when I say I didn't enjoy it. It's like I did enjoy it, but. I could have enjoyed it a lot more, I feel, and still been just as good, you know, because I was always quite focused on, on, on the job in hand. So whatever I was going to do, my mind was going to be switched on to that. So I never deviated in that sense. And sometimes smiling or being happy was a deviation. <laughs> so I was like, you know, stop that smiling, you know, get out there and yeah. do your grafting uh, and, and, and crack on. And has, has your viewpoint towards athletics and the sport that you love changed now that you're commentating, like looking at it from almost that third eye view and, and looking at other athletes going and starting their careers, have you, obviously you have more experience around it, but does your viewpoint sort of change from being in it to then being just outside? Yeah, I mean, I mean, first of all, when I retired, I became a fan of athletics again. I think once you, you get to a certain level in a sense, it starts getting on your nerves because it runs your life in, in every single element. And, you know, when you're on that acceleration ladder up to the very top and you get to the top, sustaining it for a couple of years is great. But then when you've got to kind of hang on and injuries are not getting 
better as quickly as they used to. And, you know, when you go to the same track meets that you're going to all the time and, you know, they haven't even changed the menu, like it kind of gets a little bit dull, <laughs> right? So you lose the love for, for the sport in that sense because it's a professional thing. And also you've got to remember when you're at that high level, um, you don't get to see much of your sport. So your mates you don't even see. What you do is you, you, you see the results. You don't see their performances. So you right. miss a lot. Because if you think about it, if I'm going to... It's only a two-hour meet, two-and-a-half-hour meet. It's a track meet. And if you're on right in the middle of the meet, you're there warming up for an hour, and, and then you've got half an hour, get through the call-up area, procedure that. You run your race. You do your lap of honor. You warm down. You're on the bus back to the hotel before you know. So the only time you're getting results is <laughs> when you're reading it. You don't see it. So when I retired, obviously, I could get into being a fan again and why I loved athletics. And you see every single event and, you know, you see those little intricacies of, of what happened between round one and round four of the shot put, for example, which you wouldn't necessarily yeah. see. So, yeah, I, I kind of very much now enjoy coming on that side and, and, and being a commentator and... and when I, I, I think what I try to do as a commentator is, is to inform, because I think that's your job as a commentator, to inform the general public what's going on, but also try and be quite reasonable in an athlete, because when you've been there, every athlete is trying to do their best. So even if they don't manage to be, you know, they're way off their best, they know they're way off their best. It's not for me to tell everybody and truly expose them and make them feel even worse about themselves. Mm -hmm. An athlete knows if they've underperformed. So you've got to kind of articulate that to an audience who may have been watching and have huge expectations, but then also make it all right that, you know, sometimes this happens. It's, it, it's interesting you say that because it's so easy sitting at home and going, oh, they're not performing at a certain level. And we see it a lot with, with especially in football, with punditry, mm -hmm. Really, you know, it can really be quite critical of yeah. those that, are, that may not be performing at their highest yeah. level, but it's quite refreshing then go, well, actually, I've, I've been there. I know that sometimes it might be an off day or it, whatever reason it yeah. might be in just providing that aspect to, as that well. Is, that is really important. Um, and I sometimes think you can forget it and you can become hypercritical and that's the easiest option, I always feel. So I think, you know, you, it's never forget where you're from. You know every single person is trying their best. Nobody goes out there to try badly. You know, you're not going to go out there and go, I'm going to lose today and I can't be bothered. If you put a GB vest on, you put a GB vest, you're wearing it with pride. So you're going to do your very best. And you also got to remember, you can never always be at your best. That is impossible. You're human, not a robot. So you've got to also put that into, into consideration when you start, certainly for me, when I start to earn my country. Uh, during your career, you've had a lot of achievements and records and winning medals. But I'm always intrigued to hear what you would value as your most or your best win or your best sporting moment, because some people might look from the outside and go, oh, it might be this race where you, you won, you know, some other people might consider it a certain thing. But for you, it, for other, it might be a, a race that you did when you were 16, 17, <laughs> that it was like your first whatever. So it's that, that's kind of the question. What, what would be your biggest sporting well, achievement? It has to be the world genius. Yeah. And, and that is because... Um, Eight, well, yeah, I won. <laughs> yeah, I run the second fastest time ever as a junior. That's what yeah. people see, right? That's what people see. Yeah. That's what people see. But that's not what I see. What I see was I had to get my mind around an injury at a really young age. I had to get my round mind around being a favourite coming into a competition and carrying an injury. There's an expectation of the nation of me to be able to win this, but they don't know I've been injured for three weeks. And so you've got to kind of learn to deal with that. And if you get through that and you win, that sets you up for the rest of your career because now you always have that sense of belief because mm. now, you know, three weeks out, you get an injury, you go, well, I did it when I was 19. I can do it you now. You know what it feels like. Exactly. You know what it feels like. And what are you thinking on a start line to a race? Are you, can you park all <laughs> of those emotions or are you thinking just quick? <laughs> 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 you know, yourself and Michael Johnson had this conversation, right? So we all know Michael, great 400, 200 meter runner. And we sit there, we were chatting away about this same thing while you just asked me, what do you feel like? MJ, what do you feel like when you race? He used to go, oh, I love it, Carl. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I went, no wonder, because hey, nobody's going to beat you. <laughs> so, of course, you're going to absolutely love it. And I said, the other thing, MJ, that you hadn't had in front of you that I have is three and a half foot of 
metal and wood, right? <laughs> <laughs> that if you hit them, they flame in hurt, right? I, I was going to so, say, it, I, I can, right? it looks like they hurt. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I always had that sense of anxiety, courtesy of having that in front of me. So if I was, I said to him, if I didn't have any hurdles in front of me, man, of course, I'd love it. You know, when I used to run 60s indoors, mm. you know, I used to love it. There was nothing there and I'd be laughing because I was thinking, ah, if you can catch me, it's great, but don't worry, there's nothing in front of me, so I'm just going to charge. <laughs> it's that, it's that uh, extra obstacle. Absolutely. In the, in the way. That's just plays in your mind. So mm. you always got to be wary of it. You know, my coach always used to say to me, you know, you have to respect the hurdles because they will bite you back. Yeah, you can see, like, some of the injuries I can imagine. But did you have a favourite place to complete, or do you still have a place that now you like to go and, 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 and do punditry for? Um, to compete, I would say Rome. Um, because of because of the place or because of the stadium or memories there? Um, Rome, because I was always the start of my race, season. So even if I, I may do some early season races in Germany and, and, and just get myself in, but when I was running early in Germany, I, I was still like just coming out of winter training, so I wasn't really ready. But Rome would always be our target in that sense. A, because conditions, it was always like 26, 27 degrees, perfect. No wind, still completely. And also they had a full-on warm-up track um, right next door. An early season, especially over high hurdles, you haven't quite got the, the race skills ingrained, so you need to be able to warm up properly. So Rome would always give you that opportunity, and then from there you just go in and, and compete. And yeah, and... I think I'm most probably, oh, I don't know, if I raced in Rome 10 times, I'd have won eight of them. Yeah. So it was a, a good, good place, place yeah, <laughs> for me to work Was as, there as a well. place that you went that you went, oh, we've got to go, <laughs> we've got to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, loads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the rest of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all but Rome. It's funny, this is, I'm going to kind of flip that question for you a little bit. And it says, there's places I went to I never won. Right. Of all the years I went to, uh, but I enjoyed going there. So Lausanne, I never won the meet in Lausanne. And bizarrely enough, Lausanne ends up the track where I lose my world record outdoors. <laughs> so it's quite interesting that of all my attempts of, of trying to win that race, I never, ever, ever won it. Second place was normal. But I could never just take the victory in Lausanne, which was just an odd thing. Really strange. You mentioned world record there. I have to ask the childish question of what does it feel like to go, I'm, I'm holding a world record, something that no one in recorded time has done before? It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Get used to it. Yeah. Okay. Is it, do you know what? <laughs> are you trying to break it yourself with it again? No, or are you quite no. defensive of it? Is it just like this is... It, it's, it's an odd thing. It's a really odd yeah. thing. Um, because what all the, I always saw it, and then... This, I know you're going to reach over and want to slap me across my face when I say <laughs> this now, but it was just like my PB. Right, so, yeah. you know, like everybody has a PB, right? And you always want to do a PB, don't you? You want to try your best to be... But sense tells you can't always do a PB. So um, it's just happened that my PB was the best PB out there in my event, <laughs> right? But I wanted to do a personal best every single time that I could, could of compete. And it's very different. And I say I kind of did it by winning the world title. But my objective was to win the world title at that particular time. And it was a really different challenge when I was trying to break the world indoor record. because, And, and, and I saw it very different as well. Because I remember every race I was going into, I was trying to break the world record. Right. And that's a, a very different way of setting a target in that sense. Because my focus wasn't on my individual performance. I was kind of taking it there. I want the world record. I want the world record course i did it eventually but i never appreciated all my other performances on the way to breaking the world record because i didn't achieve the goal of the day so even if i won it's that was irrelevant my goal was the world record so if i ran the second or third fastest time in history wasn't good enough wasn't good enough so i would always leave the race slightly um, down that kind of relates to what you said earlier about maybe not enjoying that part as much as you probably could have or look back absolutely. now, I wish you had. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I blame my coach for that. He'd <laughs> always say, Yeah, you can break the world record, break the world record. We're doing it at this race, we're really? doing it at that race. And I'd be, I'd ring him. I remember, <laughs> I remember ringing him going, oh, I ran 7.37. And at the time, the world record was 7.36. And he'd go, What do you do wrong? And he was never, 
<laughs> it was really? never like, well, well done. That's the second fastest ever. <laughs> it was just like, what do you do? Why did you do that? And then another race, I'd run a heat and I'd run 7.38 in the heat. And then I'd run 7.38 in the final. And he's like, why haven't you improved? So it's just like... Weird, on one hand it's pushing you, but on the other hand it's like, well, hold on, yeah, hold on. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, right? Yeah. And when you look at it in, in the bigger picture, now I always think to myself, see, I should have just been happy and really celebrated and run those, those, those incredible moments as well. So then transitioning to towards the end of your career and then uh, th- looking to a post-career career, Mm-mm. do you know that it's coming towards the end of your competing time, <laughs> injuries, and just, it, it, was it something forced upon you, or was it your own choice? Yeah, I, I'm laughing there, and I know you were asking the question quite seriously, <laughs> and I was hoping that you didn't burst out laughing, because I was I was laughing at the time. <laughs> you kind of know what's coming to the yeah. end, right, <laughs> in that sense. But it's bizarre, because what comes to the end more than anything is your mind goes more than your actual physical ability. Right. So what I really struggled with was the motivation to race. Because, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know if you can remember, a great sprinter called Alan Wells, right? And I met Alan um, just after I retired. And myself and Alan were quoting, right, what was on the lunch menu at the Zurich World Classa, right? And it was the same menu he had that we had. Right, so it's that sense of monotony that gets you in the end, where yeah. you think to yourself, "Do you know what? I, I, I can't do this anymore." I enjoyed the training aspect, I enjoyed the social part of it, and I enjoyed like, hanging out with my mates. But like then to say to me, "Right, get on the plane, you've got to go and race there," it's like, "Oh, do I have to?" So your head goes mm-hmm. definitely before the physical side of it. So the day I retired, I could have still ran the next week. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with me physically, which I think is the best way to go out. It was on your terms. And yeah. did you have an idea of what you wanted to, to then go into? And we obviously we did chat about um, bits and pieces, but do you know, okay, I want to do some commentary and I want to do some o- my own thing as well. Um, I wanted to fall off the radar. Completely. Really? Do you be, when, would you believe that? <laughs> How's and that worked? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how's that gone for you, Colin? <laughs> yeah. Um, I did, I did. And I remember when the BBC first came up, <laughs> came up to him, um, Martin came up to me and he spoke to me guy called Martin Webster came up, who was our exec at the time, and he said to me, um, right, you know, we'd love you to do some um, punditry and some commentary for us, and what do you think about that? And I said, no. Oh, really? Like, you said no straight away? Sorry? I was like, no, I have no interest in that. And he said, oh, okay. And he said, well, you know, you've had a long athletic career. Why don't you just give us, like, two years then? Just give us two years and see how you feel. And I was like, I really don't want to do it. And he's like, why? And I said, because... I've given enough already. I just want to vanish, if you don't mind. Mm. And he went, give us two years. And that was in 2003 and 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he said two decades. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. In but the yeah. fine print. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe that's what it was. But yeah, so I, yeah, I didn't have no real incentive to go into to, to anything like that. But I really didn't know what I wanted to do. If I could have done anything, I'd like... <laughs> I do not laugh when I say this, but I'd like to have done sport in documentaries, history sport in documentaries, because I find history quite interesting, and I think it's always interesting for people to see where things started to where we are today. So history docs are all things that I, w- I wanted to get involved in and produce, um, but they kind of forced me on screen instead. <laughs> well, I was going to say, that that's one thing. Strictly Come Dancing is another thing as well. That's that's not quite hiding away from... <laughs> I know. What was that all about? But it must have been an amazing experience as well. But do you know how I got involved in that? was because my mate was producing the show. Oh, really? So, because Gareth was producing one of the producers on the show, and he asked me, he said, oh, do you fancy coming on this show? And I was like, what is it? And he was like, oh, it's a dance show. And uh, I was like, it's not happening. And he went, oh, go on, I think you'll have a laugh. And he kept badgering me, badgering me, badgering me, badgering me. And then in the end, I kind of gave up. I went, all right, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So, yeah, I went on Strictly. And it was one of the best things I've ever done. Thoroughly enjoyed it. A lot of people, when they come off, say it's so intense and it's, it's you know, week to week. And obviously, when, like yourself, go further into the competition, it's a lot. But they say it's just the best experience. If anyone has the opportunity, go and do it. Yeah. Y- yeah, I mean, it's... I don't know how to describe it apart from it's a whole heap of fun. For me, I used to say to people, it's the best bit of athletics. Right. Now, and it's like, it's hard, <laughs> and it's hard for me to actually explain what I say. But it's the truth. The best things that I loved about athletics strictly provided. So there was a competition, which athletics is great, but there was no pressure in this competition. Which So the pressure of the competition, I wasn't so keen on, but like the competition element. So... 
that's what you get in strictly in that sense learning a new skill all mm. the time so always upskilling yourself um making your body move etc cetera, etc cetera. so it just delivered so many things amazing so tell me about um go dad run and oh, yeah? what it is and why it's so important and mm. uh, yeah tell me about it yeah so i did set up go dad run um with my sister initially and what we kind of do then was an event where we just tried to engage with men specifically uh, and prostate cancer uh, in that sense two of my uncles uh, had had it and one unfortunately died and we realized certainly in the afro caribbean um kind of family you know the extended family in that sense it was one in four uh, men would would yeah. get prostate cancer and, and, and because men don't speak, um, they end up suffering and we lose so many great men for no reason. And we, I look really close to my family in that sense. It was my uncle who was really talkative was the one who survived and my uncle who hardly spoke was the one who died. So it was a clear thing then that it was really important to make sure we get this commu uh, communication out there. And, you know, it was really great to... To, to get that under our belt, myself, my sister, and we worked very hard to get it going. And in the end, we saved so many people's lives. And you know, when you get messages on, on, on the forum saying, without this, we wouldn't have got tested. And if we didn't get tested, we wouldn't be here today. And those are the type of things that really, for me, that really make you feel just great, that you've done a good job. Yeah, and you're making a, li a literal tangible difference to people's lives. And Absolutely. it must be, like you said at the beginning, you have people today coming up to tell you about their story. Yeah. I'm sure as well you have times where people come up to you and tell you about their story, you know, it, 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 in that sort of, uh, in that world. So yeah. Yeah, it's a massive thing. Yeah, no, it is. It's huge. And, and I think once you started seeing that and that kind of, that magic, I use the word that magic happening, that you're communicating with people and you are making a difference. I think that's when it kind of swung me over then to start working with the Wings of Life World Run team uh, in that sense, because it was a similar kind of thing we were trying to do. You know, A, first of all, bring awareness to spinal cord injuries, because yep. that's really important, first of all, because people don't really get it um but also to the foundation of what we're trying to do and how we spend our money in the foundation and that is solely for spinal cord research we want to find a cure for spinal cord injury and it's the information that you can give to people where they they sometimes think one thing and the reality is very different so you know if i say to people where do most spinal cord injuries come from they'll go oh mainly extreme sports yeah. or something like that, or that. And, well no it's house everyday household stuff that will do it Car accidents are things that create most spinal cord injuries. And how many of us get in our car every single day and don't even think about sometimes what the consequences can be? So, you know, this is where you get that storyboard uh, across to people. Let them understand the importance of, of what we're trying to do. Yeah, well, you've, you've segued it perfectly. You're wearing, wearing the, the top as well. Yeah, you've been at the, the National Running Show today chatting uh, to loads of people on the stand here and talking about it. But give us a bit more about uh, your involvement in it. And obviously, you've, t you've spoken about the aim there and the yeah. spinal cord and find, finding that cure. Sure. Um, yeah. But uh, the event as well, because that's, that's an amazing thing. When you look on the website... <laughs> Of this, uh, it's a virtual run. I yeah. mean, you, you you put it better in your words, but it, it looks very cool. It is very cool. Now, yeah. of course, I'm going to be biased when I say it's very no, but cool. It is. But, but it, it is. is. It is really cool. It's industry. I mean, when we first started getting involved with the Wings Fly for World Run, it's our biggest found, um, fundraiser. Yeah, um, that we have for the particular project itself. And um, what we try to do, we realize we can't reinvent the wheel. People run, right? So we know what people run and they enjoy running. So what we tried to do is create something that was a little bit quirky um, that people will get involved with. And so when you have an event where the actual finish line comes to you and you don't run towards the finish line, <laughs> was first of all trying to get people's head around mm. that, right? So initially what happens, you start 30 minutes before our virtual catcher car in that sense. Uh, and then the catcher car increases its speed every half an hour to eventually it catches everybody right, in, in that sense. So what I say to people, you know, most people think it may be intimidated by going to, example, to run a marathon because they think, I can't run that far. It's a, a long way. Well, in our event, of course, you only go as far as the car catches you. You're never going to run out of steam, to be honest, because the car will always catch you before you can actually stop running or stop walking or whatever. And so what we do, we get people... We feel that it's an event that allows 
everybody to be part of it because as i say you only go as far as you can go so if you're in a wheelchair and you're wheeling if you're on crutches whatever you do you can only go as far as you can go i think that's so important because like you said marathon it can be very intimidating and very you know it's, it's, a, it's a lot and um, it's achievable for, achievable for anyone but looking at it uh, objectively is quite tough but this like you said you can get involved uh, to obviously until the car catches you but there's <laughs> actually a very cool slider on the website where you can yes. see oh, if i'm going at this speed how long is it going to take right? me so yeah. you can <laughs> almost set yourself a little challenge as well but yeah. where it's virtual you can also do it in safety of around the area that you absolutely. know and you can do it in in a community with people, friends family yeah, colleagues absolutely. whatever else so um absolutely yeah when, when is it yeah so it's on may the 7th it starts at 12 o'clock here in the uk and as you mentioned there yeah you can literally do it from outside your door so soon as the, the we tell you on the app that you can set off off you go you start your run um so you can run on your regular run yeah you know or your regular Walk, whatever you do, wherever you exercise, wherever you're going outside. But if you're some of these people who kind of enjoy doing it with groups, we also have a, a, the group runs, that sense, then four locations in the UK. They're Bath, London, Manchester, Glasgow. So you have the opportunity, if you're close to one of those, to get involved in a bigger environment in that sense. And I always think to people, you know what? I always feel I want you to feel a little bit disappointed in your performance because it means you'll come back next year because you, like yeah. you always know you always know you can, can do, do a little bit better exactly and everybody always says to me the first thing when i say to them how was the run they all go oh you know i swear i could have gone a little bit further and i was like well you have to sign next up next year, year right next and year. take that same old challenge in that way so yeah it's a lovely event and of course because it happens exactly the same time across the globe so when i say exactly the same time it doesn't mean it's 12 o'clock in the uk it's 12 o'clock in new york and no no it goes five hours behind so people in new york will be starting at 7 a.m yeah. and if they're further across you're in japan of course you'll be starting at 8 p.m at night because you're eight hours ahead yeah but that same time it's 11 o'clock utc or greenwich mean time if you're old school <laughs> is, is where you start on so everybody in the world starts exactly at the same time and then you get your your global results your global ranking so we'll send you a certificate um you're on a pdf you can see where you finished in the world, also where you finished in your region. So you, if you're here in the UK, you would see that you finished, like, let's say you're the champion of the UK. You're the champion of the UK and you were fourth in the world, for yeah. example. So you would get the, to steer where you are. So that's why it's a lovely event to, to get people, you know, we connect in people from around the world, you know, because you could be here in the UK, you could have family in Australia or family in South Africa or in the United States, yeah. and you can all run the race at the same time and... Set yourselves a little challenge. Who's going to be the champion? <laughs> it's, it's a lovely, inclusive event, and it's also raising money and awareness for for such an important thing that you, you spoke about before. Yeah, so. it is really important for us in that sense, and we really let people understand why we are doing it. Spinal cord research is so underfunded, and, you know, I've spoken to lots of the scientists yeah. along the way, and, and they've all said the same thing, that we will find a cure. It's only about time. And what buys time, as we know, as it so successfully did in COVID, was cash, right? Yeah. When cash gets thrown at something, you, can you see get the, the big brains on it, and we, we will find a cure. Absolutely. So if I'm, when I'm signing up to it, uh, after listening to this, where, where do I go? Go straight on the Wings of Life World Run dot com website. That's the easiest place. You'll get all the information there. If you're a little bit funky and you're going on the Red Bull website, you can also find a little bit of a link there because yeah. we're really fortunate that Red Bull cover all our administrative costs. So every single penny that is raised during the Wings for Life or any time you see our Wings for Life logo, 100% of that money goes to the research. So not a penny is screamed off yeah. for like to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all covered, all covered. Uh, a couple of quick questions, um, general questions before we let you go. And, and thank you again so much. It's been uh, really enjoyable. How do you, how do you keep fit now? Because you, you are very fit and you, you keep active. You can see yeah. it on your social media. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah, what, what, that, that's almost like that personal motivation. Uh, yeah. You know, like I said, I enjoy going outside. So I, I walk and I, I was just explaining to somebody just recently. That I was saying that when I walk, my walk's about 6K every morning. And so where I live is by the coast. And so you go, where there's always coast, there's always a little bit of hills. So um, I walk mainly on the flat bits. And then when I see a little bit of an incline, there you go, you'll see me sailing up there. So I kind of do that. I also love the gym. I always loved the gym when I was a, a, an athlete because um, you always stay dry and it's warm. It's great, right? <laughs> is, is, there, um, is there something, are you just trying skateboarding now? Yeah. Is there something else that you're like, 
I've, I've seen that, but I've always wanted to give it a go, but I never have. Is there something that you, oh, maybe at some point I'll give it, I'll give it oh, a try? Oh, being a decent human being, I think. <laughs> <laughs> at I'll, some point. I'll, I'll at give some that point, at some, some stage. I'll, I'll have a go at that. But uh, yeah, no, sporting wise, I think I, I ticked it all. I think, you know, learning to do winter sports well so I can ice skate, you know, and I can um, skate and now I can well, I've always been able to ski and I can snowboard so all those things where I can really enjoy going out into the wilderness I'm, I'm fortunate that I can do I really realize I got a blessed life I can't complain love that love that and the final thing for me it kind of leads on from that is that I love to ask people that come on for, for a piece of advice for the mm-hmm. people listening and, and for the guests that are on the podcast as well and it can be about anything it can be small big whatever um, what's a piece of advice that you would leave that you might have heard that you'd like to pass on or just from you do you know, I'd always say to people, enjoy what you can do, you know, because you never know what is around the corner. You know, one of the things I always say to my mother when we go to places and there's the elevator and there's the stairs. And I always say, Mom, do you know what? Let's take the stairs. And she's like, no, no, elevator. And I was like, you know what? There'll be a time you won't be able to take the stairs and you have to ride the elevator. So let's take the stairs. And she's like, you're right. Just let you think about a moment, you know. So give yourself always that little bit of time. Just think about that particular moment and enjoy it. Colin, thank you so much. It's been great to have a laugh. And we're looking forward to the Wings for Life World Run. Thank you very much. May the 7th. Thank you very much. Take care. And she's like... And thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Outside and Active podcast with Colin Jackson. I had a really, really lovely conversation with Colin. He was a really nice guy and really interesting to hear about this amazing event which is coming up in partnership with Red Bull. So you can check that out by heading to their website. There will be a link in the podcast description. And yeah, thank you again to Colin for coming on. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more episodes, please, please hit that follow or subscribe button on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to this episode. Leave a review and also pass it on to a friend. If you think they'd enjoy it just as much as you, then let's grow this outside and active community. We'll be back next week with another episode. But until that time, enjoy the outdoors.